Welcome everybody to our second Design at Large talk for this spring. I'm really excited to have Sean Lotrig in today. Uh, Sean was introduced to me by Michelle Morris, who's been accusing about it for a good long while now. And it was a great pick because, as you know, one of the major themes in our lab is thinking about new models of uh, education. And one thing that we don't do enough of, that I'd love to do more of, is thinking about new models for education at places other than at universities. Uh, and that's what uh, Dr. Sean Mosher does. He uh, has his doctorate in education from uh, Arizona State, which many of you know is one of the uh, leading universities for uh, new models of education research. Really cool place. And he's a San Diego native and is now back in San Diego uh, at the Urban Design Academy where he's been doing a whole bunch of cool stuff. He also was featured as one of the TED Ed 16 innovators, which is, which is you know, 16 is a pretty small number, so that's super <laughs> cool. And uh, it's great to see a bunch of folks here from uh, all around campus, and let's welcome Sean. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for having me in addition to Arizona State University and several other places. Uh, I consider UCSD one of my home. Uh, UCSD, not only did I spend a great deal of time on campus uh, as a San Diego native, but also uh, my teaching credentials and my supervision credentials and my admin credentials all came from UCSD. So I feel like uh, I was back home today, including having Tina take me over to the bookstore to pick up my Triton uh, swag. <laughs> So for today, I, I prepped out a bit by talking to several people. Uh, you may be one of those people sitting here in the room to talk about what it is we want to may perhaps engage in today. And really, I wanted to engage in a discussion about a lot of what we do at university, which is talking about the theory of how things work, but how it practically is being applied in the world. So that way, we can have a, a dialogue about that. Now, because I work in K-12 education, I'm constantly getting updated. My students have made it so that way I have static QR codes. So that way if you want to follow me on LinkedIn, Twitter, or any of those things, those are available for you. We'll put them up later. This one down here for younger people, this is a website. It is an old-fashioned technology that we used before we had social networking. Uh, also, I do have a Facebook page, or as we call it, Instagram for old people page, uh, that you can find me on as well. So I want to open up by talking about just a simple design challenge for today in the room. And we're going to go through three design challenges. Two will be active in the room. One is a design challenge I want to leave you with. And the design challenges in part also pertain to three assertions that I'm going to make today. You don't have to agree with my assertions and you don't have to agree with my findings. That's the beauty of design thinking. But I want to walk you through part of the processes of how I got there so we can move from theory to practice and how we can use design thinking in the complex world that we exist in. So for the first design challenge for today, we have two words within the presentation title I want to make sure we have some form of common definition on. So the first one is on the term design. And what I'd like to challenge you to do is just take 15 to 20 seconds right now and silently reflect to yourself on the word design and what it means to you. Outstanding. 20 seconds of wonderful silence to reflect. What I want to invite you to do now is turn to somebody close to you, around you, and just share a few thoughts for 30 seconds on what are some of the key characteristics of design that are important to you. Let's just take 30 seconds to engage in that together.
Outstanding. We're going to bring it home in about five seconds. Four, three, two. Outstanding. So, when we talk of design and we share about the term design, there are some things in there that are not uncommon to hear. And we're not going to ask everybody to share out. But a lot of times when we talk about design, we talk about a thoughtful process. A process of moving through, a process of engaging in different viewpoints, a process of developing something that's new and different. And we also often talk about the term intentionality. Right? It's an intentional act. For example, I moved my water bottle here. It was intentional. There is no purpose to it. It was not designed. I didn't think about it. I chose to place my water bottle somewhere random in the room. So intentionality in and of itself isn't designed. It involves not just an intentional act, but an intentional act typically of empathetically understanding things differently and producing something differently. The second term that's essential for us to understand before we engage in a theoretical conversation is the term development. And we don't always have the same meaning of the term development. In fact, research science tells us that most words we don't all have the same definition and understanding of. So we're going to go through this one more time, and I invite you again to spend 20 seconds silently reflecting on the term development and what it might mean to you. Outstanding, once again, 20 seconds of wonderful silence. You can tell I'm from K through 12 education. We don't get 20 seconds of silence, <laughs> ever. Uh, I have staff here with me today, Ms. Dale, who will attest to that. Now, if you don't mind being conscious of the time, 30 seconds speaking to somebody other than the person you just spoke to about your concepts of development. Remember, that's very quick. That's about 15 seconds each in, in, in exchange. Please engage. We've got about five seconds left of our 30 seconds then. We're counting down to four, three, two, one. Thank you so much. Now again, not asking for a share out at this juncture, but from most of our perspectives, many of us default to the idea of development as a good thing, a positive connotation. Depending upon where you sit in that development, you may have a different opinion. So that's a relational aspect to what we're talking about today. Because not everybody agrees with our concepts of design and design thinking as a positive connotation. And it is our responsibility to be empathetic to them as well as we engage in this. In one of my opening conversations that we had at the design lab earlier this year, we talked about this concept of design or default and going back into this connotation that either we have the intentionality of design or we default into where we are. And to this end, we open up today's presentation as we get into the theoretical <coughs> frameworks that we're going to talk about practically towards the end. We start with the simple idea that every system is perfectly designed to get the results it's given. Whether it be biological, human engineered systems, systems of nature, they are perfectly designed to get the results they're getting. In my case, I work in the field of K-12 education. We like to refer to this sometimes as the epicenter of wicked problems, the place where everything intersects. 
We oftentimes talk about K through 12 education and talk about the results it's getting. It is perfectly designed to get the results it's getting. But then we have to ask ourselves, what do we want to do about that? Do we want to design something better or do we want to default into the existing system in the way it is? We are generally, as people, by and large in Western society designed to think of things in Boolean fashion. Zeros and ones, rights or wrongs. This is part of the programming of a lot of what happens. You get a lot of that programming from schools. And a lot of the concepts that we talk about in design thinking and in design don't jibe well with those concepts from schools, right? Within design, failure is part of a process, it's part of learning. Please tell me and raise your hands how many of you in this room went running home with an F on your report card to claim, look mom, look how much I'm learning. It doesn't happen. You're indoctrinated within education into a deficit model of thinking. Please feel free to go back and review your spelling checks, tests in first and second and third grade. Chances are they're going to reflect your indoctrination into Western deficit thinking. They will be marked minus two, minus four. They're not marked plus five, plus eight. The mark minus, an indoctrination into the deficit thinking, into rights and wrongs, not into the ambiguity that design thinking demands that we embrace as part of being. When we talk about design thinking and implementation, we have to acknowledge the philosophical and psychological attributes of any organization. And to this end, I'm going to share with you a brief true story that demonstrates how we have such major disconnections in this at times. And it's a story that I've been invited to share by somebody that was, and still is, rather close to me. It is a board member. And it comes from 2010. And in 2010, I was in a large board meeting. Um, and if you've never been to a public education board meeting, sometimes there's hundreds of people at these meetings. And I was at a board meeting, and at this board meeting, the Board of Trustees took a vote, and the vote was that from this day forward, from now on, all movements that will be adopted by the Board of Trustees will be grassroots movements. I was sitting in the third row, and I began to laugh hysterically. The uh, Board President looked at me, knowing me, and kind of tilted their head sideways and were curious as to what was going on. The board meeting went on for two hours, and from time to time, I would erupt with giggles. At the end of the meeting, he came to me and said, why are you laughing at us? And I said, I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing kind of around you. But I want to make sure I have this right. You just voted from a command and control position that all movements will be grassroots movements. That, in and of itself, is not a grassroots movement. Out of the gate, the paradox of what you've done negates the intentionality of what you wanted. The philosophy did not match the act. And in that, we create organizational hypocrisy. And that organizational hypocrisy can undermine our efforts. So part of our effort today in this talk is connecting some ideas as to how some of these complex systems interact and how organizational philosophy, including those things that we don't like to talk about, regulations and codes and charters, how all of those manifest themselves between practice and philosophy and beliefs and what those do and how those things go about being. In that discussion, we have to face a few simple facts. First of all, that there are the written documents of any organization that are the ones that help to guide it. But there's also the unwritten social contracts. And it's the unwritten social contracts interacting with the written ones that create culture. And it's this thing we talk about all the time, organizational community culture, organizational community culture. Culture is an artifact of the philosophical beliefs, in my opinion, and in my experience, of the organization. And I want to explore this with us together and invite you to that conversation onto how some of these things manifest itself in complex systems and what we can do in looking at our own design of organizations. Because I personally believe, from my experience, that design thinking can only flourish if an institution adopts it 
as a practice in whole, not in a practice in part. That it cannot be design thinking for them, but not for you. That it has to be one in the same and a togetherness to it. So I hope you will stick with me for the next 40 minutes or so as we gallop through a large number of concepts as it pertains to these. The first thing I present just for us to have an understanding of each other is that I believe by its nature design thinking is more of an ecological way of thinking. And to that end, when I speak about the various layers that we have in organizations, I use Brofenbrenner's ecological systems design theory to ground myself. And just a brief overview into that theory, we have the Cronus system goals. These are life goals, major events of any organization or individual. You have those macro systems, large systems going on around you. You have exosystems and boards interactions. You have your own business units or colleges. You have your classrooms or your own little offices. And crushed down here at the bottom is the individual. But you are embedded in all of those items. And when we talk about culture, culture is generally interacting between these systems. And how it ebbs and flows is something that creates belief structures within people. When it comes to looking at complex organizations and what they are engaged in, should you be a believer in a community of practice or whatever your localized theory or phenomenon, I put forward an assertion that the practice of the individuals within an organization is proportional to its philosophical beliefs, both overtly stated and covertly in act within the individuals within it. I'm going to explore this just for a moment, and I know we're not all educators in the world, so I'm, but I'm going to take it from my standpoint and from where I am. I'm going to take a look at a school and the way this interacts. Now, in terms of looking at schools, Schools have been, as I've stated, sort of cited as a place that are an epicenter of what Riddle and Weber first described in 1973 as being wicked problems. Now, wicked problems have some very specific things, but the most telltale thing of a wicked problem is that the problem also is the symptom of another problem. This is one of the key features. So when you think about education, and I say it's the epicenter of wicked problems, when we deal in education, we're dealing with poverty. Okay? We're dealing with transportation. We're dealing with inequities of food services. We're dealing with health care. Right? Now, we can argue back and forth all day about whether health care is a problem for education or education creates the poverty system or poverty drives. We can do that all day long. In fact, I've done that all day long, many, many days and had a wonderful time in those arguments. But what Riddle and Weber state to us, and Weber state to us, is that nearly every problem, if not wicked in and of itself, has a degree of what they call wickedity to it, which is an elastic scale. So I'm choosing education, first of all, because it's self-serving to me, and I'll be honest about that, but also because it represents a complex social system that interacts in many different ways. So an example of theory to practice. At the high level, when we talk at universities, we're talking about our ontology, epistemology, the theoretical perspectives, and we'll get there together. And that's a very lofty thought that typically most schools are not thinking of, right or wrong. When we get over to the school level, we're talking about educational philosophy. What do you believe educationally? By the way, everybody in education, we like to say we're all progressivists. Not true, but we love to say it. We'll demonstrate that shortly. We argue about the purpose of school. What is the school structure? What, who's leading the school? What are the subject studies? Those are, those are district and school level conversations that are ongoing. Then you have the people that are actually teaching and running schools. They're looking at pedagogical strategies, solutions, orientation. You know, what are we doing with our kids? Are they solving for known problems, unknown problems? This is the sort of thing that's going on. But then when it comes to trying to redesign one of the most complex organizations that we're seeing, like school systems, we engage in the following conversations. 
During professional development this week, we're going to talk about the five essential pedagogical strategies that you should be engaged in. As if five pedagogical strategies is enough to deal with the wickedity of problems that are being fixed. This is one of my favorites. I've been through this a lot. Um, in fact, we were joking the other day, schools used to have a code name for me because I was known for reorganizing schools and when I'd come on campus, the fear was I was coming to tell you we were reorganizing things. Let's talk about the school structure. How are we gonna structure the school? Are we gonna have large schools, small schools, personalized learning communities, what's it going to be? And we won't talk about those things in any other way other than exclusively having conversations from side to side. We haven't even engaged in a conversation that's fundamental to having any dialogue here about a break at the ontological level as whether we are idealist or realist. Because if we are realist, there is only one way, and it's out there, and we have to find it. And if we are idealists, there are many ways. We haven't had a basic organizational conversation in many places that needs to take place in order to get to a point to even understanding if design thinking is appropriately being supported as a way. Now, because we haven't had all of those conversations, then we can't get to a point when we talk about education of what do we mean when we say all students? We don't know. Right? Education is always believed it's about all. Right? Originally, in, in, when you go back into the history of the United States education system, the first high school was bought in Boston Latin, and it was for all students, right? But it was all white land owning guys from England, right? With British names. That's who it was for. It's the prep school for Harvard. My name, Sean, last name Losher, first name Irish, last name German, not so welcome. Right? Then we expand out all and we keep going. But if we haven't had these talks, what do we mean by the limits of all? Are we talking about children with cerebral palsy? I have a child with cerebral palsy. I believe that a high level of achievement is still possible. Do, do we mean all students that have a certain IQ or reference scale walking in the door? That's where the getting stuck is, because we don't have clarity within our organizational philosophy which is not something we talk about a lot, because we don't look at organizations as being necessarily philosophical in nature. So here's our design challenge two for today. Um, really, design challenge two is a silent reflection, and I will share my own thoughts, and you are welcome to disregard them and substitute of your own, as a, a good friend of mine likes to say, uh, and open up sentences by saying, in my own opinion, which is always right to me, I will present my own answers to this question. But looking at philosophical alignment is one thing, but really what we are seeking at an organizational level is what Kuhn would tell us is a paradigm. What, what is the paradigm we want the organization to function on? And before we talk about these as being theoretical exercises, this is what I've been working with people on in the field for many years. So creating a paradigm is really about taking a look at the first top lever level of philosophy. And in my case, I'm using the Crotty 1998 model because Crotty works for me. Whoever works for you is fine. Uh, a couple of things don't work for me in Crotty. We'll talk about that briefly. But really, at the ontological level, the study of being. Next, epistemology. What, epistemology, what... What is knowledge? The theoretical sections, what are your assumptions about reality? The methodology in terms of what are we doing and what is out there. I will state at its uppermost level, the one thing that is difficult for me and always has been difficult for me to get my head around is that there are two definitions for, of ontology that come out of the root Greek word. One is that of being, the other is that of becoming. And part of the argument here is that when you're engaged in something like design thinking, you are transcending being into a state of becoming. And so therefore, I have asserted the following. 
that for design thinking, it's based on idealism, it adopts subjectivism, it is postmodernistic in nature, for those that are of that branch, I, I would even go further and say beyond Deleuze and postmodernism and a thousand past plateaus, moving into uh, Brahman's work on liquid modernity and looking at how flow, highly fluid things are. And the part where I've always gotten stuck is then design thinking is thought as a methodology. And what I would assert is that when I work with people on this and we talk about we're adopting design thinking as as this thing we are doing together at every level. When you look at idealism, subjectivism, and postmodernism, design thinking in and of itself becomes a way of being. It's not a method. It's not just a disposition. It's a way of being in the world. There's no process, right? I mean, we talk about, you know, this is our own localized thing. We don't even call it a method locally. We'll talk about that, that we call an approach, because right, it's not steps. It's not like we're done connecting and empathizing, yay, move on to step two. It's not the way it works. We continue in that at all points. Uh, many of our lessons I will share that we work with on students, um, we don't actually end up empathizing until we end up figuring out we're asking the wrong question altogether. And that begins oftentimes our process of empathy. So what I'm asserting here, is that while design thinking has certain characteristics, yes, it's empathetic and human-centered. I will argue even human-centered. Perhaps we should be thinking about user-centered as one of the many users of the planet. It embraces that ambu ambiguity. It is reflexive. It involves visualization. We've talked about these things. I really tend to refer to it as a way of being that's within that paradigm. So it changes our thinking as to where we're going with it. So looking at that as a way of looking at the theory behind it and knowing that this is what has been being engaged in in conversations. And I gotta share with you, hard conversations. I'm also gonna share with you, I, I am extraordinarily fortunate to be working with some people that I'm working with right now that embrace getting challenged in the boardroom. That is not normal in a boardroom setting. When we talk about these things, you're talking about your core beliefs about reality. And that can be very difficult. So moving beyond that conversation and rolling it out into practical application. We're really talking about, are you prepared to articulate your vision of design thinking? By nature, what I've just said is incorrect. It cannot be your, it has to be collective. Hard to leave it a collective. It's about asking the right questions at the right time. Is your organization prepared to make design thinking as part of its mission? Do your values that you state we're not even getting to the ones yet of what is actually being manifested in the workplace, right? Because we all know people that say one thing and do another, right? We know the organizations we've worked with that say we have a high level of transparency. There's nothing published. Do you have the values to support design thinking? Do you have guiding principles that you're working on that help frame design thinking within your workplace? Do you have an approach? And I mean, feel free to take ideas framework off the shelf, but do you own that? Or are you working through it and developing your own thinking and becoming evolutionary in nature and exploring how it might work for you? This particular approach works for us right now. Can't tell you if it will work in five years. When you look at design thinking implementation, whether it be in design labs, and that's great. And you can look at it at schools. That's great. It's being adopted in places in the US Navy. You can go down to the USS Bon Richard down in the dry docks right now, and its captain and their crew work on design thinking. And they have a three-step process, and I asked the captain why. 
why three steps? He said, because we, we have to be really fast at sea, so we need to be able to expedite things through. But we go through a design thinking process. So in practice, you start with that sort of framework, and you have those conversations, and you have to have the courage to talk about it openly and honestly. And you have to have the willingness and the empathetic resolve to hear people that don't believe you, that believe that the existing system, the default that's in place that we will go to, is in fact what would be best. It is not my favorite term in the world, execution, but it is a business term, and it is used quite often. But how do you turn the frameworks and the philosophies into something that can become operational? So if we're talking about theory to practice, theory to practice is one thing. Framework to operationalization is something else. Because how you get to design thinking in all aspects of what you're doing doesn't just take courage in belief systems. It takes doing things fundamentally differently. Now, I want to be really clear about this when we talk about things like schools, because I've been extraordinarily unclear about it in the past. When I talk about urban discovery schools or any number of the schools I've worked in, and I talk about design thinking implementation, design thinking implementation is not something that teachers are doing in the classroom to work with students while everybody else is doing something else. Design thinking is being used by the custodial crew. Design thinking is part of our human resource development plan. Design thinking is how we look at front office and back office operations. Design thinking is how we go about looking at everything from how we cut checks, our, pay, our contract process, how we interact with others. It is everywhere. It's part of what we do all, of, all over the organization. It's not something isolated as, welcome to Urban Discovery Schools. Here's what we're doing here. The innovation unit is located over here. They're doing design thinking. Everybody else is doing teaching and learning in the 19th century model. That's not the way we, we operate. We do it at every level within the organization, including, as the chief executive officer, my not making critical decisions at times, even ones that require timeliness and expediency and stopping myself and saying, am I engaged in an organizational hypocrisy in doing what I'm about ready to do if I have not stopped and went through a process of even asking if we're asking the right question right now or if we're just trying to get through an immediate problem and taking that step back. It means that I do not direct teacher interactions. They have their own academic councils and interact and let me know their findings. It means that operational staff identify some of the critical problems that we're getting through. It means that across the ecosystem, people are involved at our schools, Students are involved in developing curriculum and parents and teachers. The expertise of the teacher is not negated, it is augmented. It is augmented by the expertise of those that have the user experience. And what a tremendous gift that is to know before we hand what we can do with that. So Sean, when do you do design thinking and when do you We get to a point in prototyping where we agree to a test. And within the test, it goes through what we would normally define in academia as an action research cycle of looking at what is out there. But we acknowledge the following. It can always be better. So if we're talking about units of study, we have teachers that at the end of the unit deconstruct with students what went well, what didn't go well. And by that, I mean students that did well on the unit, students that did not engage and normally would do well, and students that tuned out entirely. So it's not a one-off thing. It is an ongoing thing. We move the needle and continue to move the needle. And we acknowledge that we are not perfect, but it does not excuse us from seeking perfection. 
but our understanding of perfection and what's next evolves. So it's not a matter of using design thinking. And I've seen this, and I think many of us in the room, particularly if we've been engaged in faculty and staff, have been involved in design thinking movements that go nowhere because we're constantly seeking to find that perfection before we test. We get to a point where it's the best thinking in the room, and we're moving forward. And we'll grab it on the next cycle as we go through. And that's tough, and we'll talk about why in a moment, because it means that we have to create environments where people can fail and will fail, and that we have to be able to support that. And that's culturally, at least for schools, not easy. So here's a little bit of a different approach to how we're looking at things. So first of all, forgive me, we've moved from Windows to Macintosh, so some of the letters will be off. We talk about ecosystem design at the center and how we lay things out across our ecosystem. And our ecosystem is comprised of all of the people that work within the organization and everybody that touches the organization, and that becomes a really rough conversation. That is people that do food service, drop off pickup, Uber drivers from time to time, they're on site, people that are involved in this process. And we change the way we observe and the way we look at things. So we don't look at our financials at Urban Discovery Schools. We don't refer to them as financials. The chief financial officer isn't always happy about that. We look at our resource conditions. Money is a resource, but it's one of them. Um, and it's one that can be developed. So the financial matter becomes part of a discussion about resource conditions. What are the resource conditions that are available to us? What is out there? The second is we frame things differently. Rather than looking at things from an internal process approach, what are the internal processes? How are we going to be working on our internal processes? We look at things from a systems dynamic approach. And we look at our systems as being constantly as something under development and that they interact. Next, we look at things differently in terms of capacity. We don't talk about capacity. We talk about innovation and growth. Innovation's not a department, it's everybody's responsibility. We're all doing it. We're all failing all of the time. I'm the chief failure officer. I'm happy to admit it. I fail a great deal. But we're all growing. It's not just for kids. It's not just students learning. In fact, if you will go through and you look at the Urban Discovery School model that's in place, it's interesting insofar that as having a design thinking focus, it is not a vision or mission that is just about kids. It doesn't say all students will do this. Everybody's engaged in it. And the final thing is the community experience. Students, parents, everybody. And what it is that they can do. Those all intersect and interact on an ongoing basis. But these are the high level conversations that are happening as we are making decisions. What are our resource conditions? How do we want to allocate those resources to spur more innovation and growth within the organization in order to advance a community experience that is fundamentally different and creates a different system in place? In practice, in data A actions, it requires fundamental changes across the board. Some of these fundamental changes are, how do we go about treating people? I know this sounds system, very simple. How do we treat people? How do we approach it? Do we assume positive intent? When we hear a parent yelling at us, do we assume that they're angry or they assume that they love their child and they're upset about an outcome? What is our disposition towards each other? How do we approach failure? Do we have a system in place that permits appropriate levels of risk and failure as part of the fundamental learning process? We have to. You're going to fail. How do we move about from a discussion of failure is fundamentally bad? In fact, what is failure? The only failure that is not permitted within the organizations I'm working with is a failure to try. 
a failure to reach for something new. That's the only one not tolerated. Anything else, we're going to learn along the way. How do we go about evaluating performance? We fundamentally have a different human resource system. Nobody in our organization will be released for trying new innovative practices that we have gone through a design thinking process for and tries it and fails in it. You are expected to present your failures to the team, share what we've learned from them. Don't want to make that mistake again. Applications, perhaps, of what you went through to a different subject area or different matter and how it can be done. Again, not socialized norms in most organizations. How do we go about inspiring that growth, whether it be for parents and students or the people that are teaching in our schools or the front office or back office staff? Do we, do we find ourselves bold enough and courageous enough to talk about creating a better tomorrow? Not because it's convenient to say, but because we truly believe that the best days are ahead. And how do we go about demonstrating our values? It's very simple to say we're transparent. It's very simple to say that we value courage. But how do we go about demonstrating that on a daily basis? What is it that we do in order to demonstrate that to the individuals with, that we're working with? And finally, how do we articulate results? Do we articulate results in one way or many ways? Because if we choose to articulate results only through one metric lens, then again, we're engaged in a Hippocratic, uh, Hippocratic Act where we are not, in fact, going through a process of saying we want you to look at many measures and many ways of understanding and knowing. So we opened up with a statement, every system. And I truly believe that. It's one of the reasons why many organizations have troubles making transformations. It's perfectly designed to get the results it's getting. It doesn't understand that the results it's getting will soon be outdated or invalid. It sees no reason to change. It does not. The change comes over the top quickly. It can't adapt on that level, on that rate. It's not engaged in a practice of being able to redesign, and therefore, it no longer exists. So if every system is perfectly designed to get the result it's getting, I'm going to leave you today with design challenge number three. Whatever your field of work that you're engaged in, whether you be an active practitioner, whether you be faculty, staff, grad student, undergrad, take a look at your field of study, your area that you're working on, and dare to challenge yourself in terms of what it might look like if you were taking it through these fundamental thoughts about changing paradigms or shifting paradigms of thinking. If you look at your area and the expertise and examine it for its own wickedity and how it connects to other things. And then make a conscious decision that you choose to make yourself. How do you choose to see that problem? Do you choose to see it from an aspect of there's only one right way somewhere out there? Or might there be many options that can be found? Do you choose to look at it in terms of that original Boolean thinking of right or wrong, or a little more colorful way? Or do you choose to take it off the chart and acknowledge that really there's an entire spectrum of thinking you might not have ever explored, and that if you get more people around and explore their points of view, you might see it differently. Or perhaps if you explored it from a point of view that somebody is not human, might see it. In terms of what biology teaches us and biomimicry and design, or looking beyond those fields, what options might that open up? I think if you will take on that challenge in your own time and in your own way, you will find that you come to a similar conclusion, that practice then becomes proportional to the philosophical beliefs that we expunge ourselves and within our organization. 
To that end, I want to thank you so much for being invited to speak today uh, and to the continued partnership of the UC Design Lab and to UC San Diego for their outstanding leadership in our community. Um, at this point, we'll leave it open for questions.